Did you know some of the most vile, sadistic, warped killers in history got away? Most of them you won't have even heard of. Some of them right now could be living in a town near you, watching you, stalking you, and if two hard-working former detectives are right, they're conspiring to plan your murder on the dark web. This is for real. You'll hear about this underground group of modern American killers in due course, but before we talk about the present, let's look at the past. The New York Ripper Murders Many serial killers enjoy being front page news. They thirst for the attention, which as you'll see throughout this video today, is very problematic for society as a whole. Perhaps no one has had more attention than Jack the Ripper, the unknown maniac that worked at a time when London was the center of the media world. His story has been told a quadrillion times, and it seems he might have inspired copycat killers. Between March and May of 1915, the Ripper came back to life, although he was now called the New York Ripper. He brutally killed two young folks in some east side tenements of Manhattan. Only 27 years after Jack did his business in London, stories of the New York Ripper filled the American press, leading to angry mobs taking the law into their own hands. The Brooklyn Daily Times said there was a ghetto ripper. People read that a lunatic was on the loose. This caused panic in every household in this mostly poor area. This new ripper taunted police with letters signed Jack the Ripper, saying he would kill again at random. 100 cops were soon assigned to the case. What's shocking is the Ripper wrote letters to the mothers of the victims. In one letter he wrote, Dear Mrs. Murray, I really feel sorry for you, but when the excitement cools off again some evening after dinner I'm going out to kill again. You must understand that I must see blood and cut flesh. So Jack the Ripper, or someone like Jack the Ripper, chose New York City as his hunting ground. The press sold newspapers while the public lost its collective mind. Soon a news report stated, man mobbed as Ripper. It explained that a cop had to draw his gun to stop the mob from killing the man. Another story talked about a man who was seen hanging around outside Lafayette Street School. 100 students chased him down. It was a delirious time, full-on mass hysteria. For Italians, then mostly quite new to the city, it became a perilous time after a cashier who'd sold one of the victims some milk before she was killed said she'd seen a foreign-looking man who, she said, looked Italian. Some newspapers then discussed these new immigrants and their alleged strange customs. The New York Tribune wrote, It's well known that among certain ignorant immigrants from the south of Europe, there is a superstitious belief that by sacrificing a little girl, they can be cured of certain complaints. This immediately put Italians' lives at risk from the mob, even though the story was based on nothing but an idle rumor. Alas, the New York Ripper was never found, and things eventually calmed down. The next killer deserves a place in the serial killer hall of infamy. If there was such a thing as the Ripper's Ripper, it would be this guy, the worst of the worst, the Cleveland Torso Murderer. The story of this very real Ripper takes place around the southeast side of Cleveland, Ohio, in an area that was known as Kingsbury Run. That's why the killer was also referred to as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. The killer gained his nickname after his custom of dismembering all of his victims, seven men and five women, who were all found in pieces here, there, and everywhere. The hand that killed them obviously knew a lot about anatomy, just as Jack the Ripper had. As happened in London, the Cleveland Ripper chose poor, disenfranchised people as his victims. Modern researchers have called such people less dead because when they're dead, they don't matter as much as other folks with a higher social status. The Kingsbury Run area was then known as the Hobo Jungle, famous for its gambling dens, raucous brothels, vagrants, booze, and nightly punch-ups. It was one of the so-called Hoovervilles, depressed and often violent shantytowns that popped up all over the U.S. during the era of the Great Depression. Still, the authorities did try to get the man. They even put Elliot Ness on the case, the leader of the so-called Untouchables that went after the illegal booze maverick Al Capone during Prohibition. It was the sheer gruesomeness of the case that compelled the U.S. government to send their best man. In September 1934, a woman who was in her mid-30s was found. Well, her torso and thighs were, which were reported back then as rotting slabs of human flesh, found on the shores of Lake Erie. Two fishermen on Lake Erie later said they found her head bobbing up and down in the water. She became known as the Lady of the Lake after a young girl swimming in the lake said she saw a hand waving at her from the water. What's notable is that the coroner, Mr. A.J. Pierce, said there were signs of a preservative chemical on the skin of the victim. Where would one find such chemicals? You'll see soon. It was about a year later that two young men were found, each missing their head. One body had been drained of blood. Coroner Pierce said the cause of death was decapitation. The victim was later identified as 28-year-old Edward Andresy. 
Described by newspapers and cops as a snotty punk who occasionally got involved with prostitution and weed. The other body, which had signs of a chemical preservative on the skin, was not identified. Both men were also missing their manhood. Notably, unlike Jack the Ripper, the mutilations happened while the men were still alive, but the decapitation part was given as the actual cause of death. This was utterly brutal, but cops believe the killer must have drugged the victims first. The Cleveland News at the time had asked, what fantastic chemistry of the civilized mind converted him into a human butcher? In January, June, and July of 1936, more bodies were found, and the signature of the murders was the same. They were headless, and if they were men, they were found missing their genitals. In September of that year, a man tripped over something while trying to hop onto a train. He soon realized it was the upper half of a person's torso. When the police were recovering the other half from a muddy pool nearby, 600 people turned up to watch. The case shook America. Still, the Cleveland Ripper, while arguably 100 times worse than Jack in terms of severity, was not major global news. His story was never printed on thousands and thousands of newspapers or even given the major Hollywood blockbuster treatment. Despite Ness's efforts, including 5,000 interviews, he couldn't get his man. He decided the best thing to do was burn the entire shanty town down, making very poor people even more desperate in the process. Even back then, such a hardline act elicited widespread criticism. Ness was made more furious in 1938 when the killer left two of his victims, or parts of them, right near City Hall in clear view of Ness's office. This was an obvious taunt. Body parts were now being found on local streets. As one writer explained, they were literally tripping over bodies. In 1939, County Sheriff Martin O'Donnell arrested a 52-year-old bricklayer named Frank Dolzal, who was thought to be a potential suspect. He made a confession which some say now was staged. Cops broke six of his ribs, after which Dolzal was found dead in his jail cell. That hardly sounded like top detective work. The press then wrote about a mysterious man they called the Dr. X, an alcoholic physician that had lost his mind and eventually his practicing license. His name was Francis Edward Sweeney, a well-known member of an influential Cleveland family and was the cousin to the U.S. Congressman Martin L. Sweeney. Francis was a veteran of World War I and no doubt suffered from what we now call PTSD. He drank all day, often flying into blind rages. He was crushed by anxiety and depression. He also had nerve damage from a gas attack in the trenches. What's more, he worked as part of a medic unit which performed amputations in the war. After the war, he worked in a hospital. Between 1933 and 1938, when the murders happened, Sweeney's erratic behavior at the hospital resulted in five competency hearings. He barely passed each one. A man also accused Sweeney of once drugging him. This man claimed to have been given the drugs in an office, which was Sweeney's, and just so happened to be next to the coroner's room where sharp scalpels and preservative chemicals could be found. Sweeney also failed a polygraph test once he became a prime suspect. Still, Ness didn't think he had much of a chance of convicting a man of such high standing in Cleveland. Before he could be tried, Sweeney committed himself to a mental hospital from where he wrote Ness threatening letters for years to come. There was only ever circumstantial evidence against him though, so Sweeney was never charged. It's worth noting that as soon as Sweeney committed himself, the murders stopped. Now for the exceptionally grisly murders that inspired many of the horror movies you've enjoyed. Still, we bet you've never even heard these stories before. American Maniacs and Mad Axe Murderers On May 23, 1918, husband and wife Joseph and Catherine Maggio were sleeping soundly in their bed in New Orleans when a mysterious man walked up to them and slit their throats with a very sharp razor. For good measure, he took an axe to them. Joseph actually lived long enough for his brothers to discover him crawling around, although he died soon after. The killer became known as the Axe Man of New Orleans, who may have hacked and killed six and injured six more. He, or someone pretending to be him, once wrote a letter that was published in the local newspapers, in which he threatened to besmear New Orleans with blood and brains if he didn't see jazz being played on a particular night all over the city. That night, every bar, every hotel, and even people in their homes listened to jazz. He didn't kill anyone that night. This was shocking to Americans all over the country, but in those days, they were hearing more and more about crazed killers than they had in the past, particularly axe murderers. According to serial killer researcher Peter Fronsky in his book Sons of Cain, between 1900 and 1950, the U.S. saw an increase in serial killers, and many of them chose the axe as their preferred tool for their nasty deeds. In that half decade, Vronsky counts 171 serial killers, or 3.4 new ones every year. 
Other researchers have written that there were particular bad runs from 1911 to 1915 and also from 1935 to 1941. It seems war years were bad years, but that's hardly surprising given the madness of war. But there was one axe murderer that came before the two wars. He was later referred to as the Servant Girl Annihilator. A cool title for a video game, but a scary one for a person to have. This killer struck between 1884 and 1885 in Austin, Texas. And guess what? People started saying it was England's Jack the Ripper, who may or may not have decided that the weather was much better over the pond. In 1885, the New York Times wrote that two servant women in Austin were dragged from their beds and murdered. The article said, The crimes of last night surpass all others in brutality. The Times said, The servant women of Austin had been under attack for over a year. The article said seven black women and four white women had been killed the same way, mutilated by an axe. The article explained that most of the women had been outraged, which back then meant something very different from what it means today. We think you can guess what that entailed. We'll just say it had to do with indecency. There's no need to go into details. Word spread about the attacker. Everyone had their own theory about who it was. Some of the African American community who practiced voodoo thought the killer was a white man who had magic powers to make himself invisible. Otherwise, they said, how do you explain how he got in and out without even making a dog bark? Indeed, this guy was like a ghost. Hundreds of cops were then assigned to look for the man. Some thought there might be a group of men doing it and that there was some kind of dark conspiracy. No one was ever convicted. As we said, axes were often the weapon of choice, likely because axes were everywhere in those days and perhaps there were copycats. A man named Henry Lee Moore would walk into people's houses and massacre everyone with an axe, usually one he found lying around near the house. He'd just knock on the door and proceed to murder everyone. This is the theory. There could have been multiple mad axe men. The theory states he killed 23 people in total, all with an axe. In September 1911, he chose a house in Colorado Springs, using a handy axe to kill the father, mother, and four kids. A month later, he traveled to Illinois, where he did the same to a family of three. That same month, he massacred a family of five in Ellsworth, Kansas. He went to Villisca, Iowa in 1912, when his axe rampage killed six members of a family and two of their guests. Moore was a prime suspect for that one but was never convicted. There are so many axe murders back then that it's very likely that some of these deaths were caused by copycat killers. Moore was only arrested after he murdered his mother and grandmother and even then, the cops didn't immediately link the crimes with the other axe murders. This is sometimes called linkage blindness. In the early 19th century, cops from different states didn't collude. They barely even linked anything if it happened in another state. On July 4, 1911, the Baltimore Sun ran a story about another axe killer. It was said the victim so far had been mixed race, although some later stories refute that. The axe killer was very much real, though. The so-called Atlanta Ripper sent shockwaves throughout the city. People were afraid to leave their houses. The maniac was doing terrible things to these people's bodies with his axe. A daughter of one victim survived an attack, describing the man as a large black man who was powerfully built and neatly dressed. But no one was ever convicted for these horrific murders that took 21 people. Police didn't even know if they'd all been committed by the same person. The question should also be asked, did the cops try very hard given the victims were poor and in this case black? Were they less dead? In 1911 and 1912, there were equally brutal murders, 49 in Louisiana and Texas. Again, the killer walked into family houses, probably just after knocking on the door, and then wiped everyone out in the most extreme fashion. In San Antonio, this axe killer, or someone copying him, murdered a family of five. It's likely the same killer returned to the city the next year and axed to death another family of five, and then three days later, in Hempstead, did the same to a family of three. In Louisiana, he slaughtered the three members of the Byers family. In February 1911, he killed a family of four in Lafayette. And later, in November, he returned to the same city and chopped and slaughtered a family of six. Over in Denver and Colorado Springs that year, seven women were bludgeoned to death by an axe man or an axe woman. In just about all of these cases, no money or valuables were taken from the houses. This was a time of axe madness, recently discussed in the book The Axes of Evil. Back then, the stories barely even made it out of the state never mind being exported worldwide. They were likely the work of males, since males generally kill more than women. These days, only about 17% of all serial murders in the U.S. are committed by women. About 10% of all murders in the U.S., serial or not, are committed by women. We don't know the stats for the early 1900s, but we can be sure women did kill back then. Still, we imagine there were more mad-axe men than mad-axe women. 
All ethnicities have had their serial killers throughout American history. White males have made up the brunt of American serial killers. African Americans, according to Scientific American, comprise the largest racial minority group among serial killers, representing approximately 20% of the total. Still, it's mostly white males whose murderousness gets turned into movies and TV shows. It's also interesting that the data shows that serial killers tend to kill people of their own ethnicity. Oftentimes, they start in places they're familiar with, but then expand to new areas as they progress. What's important is that the American serial killer was becoming something of a household celebrity in the early 20th century, more so than in other countries, which might be one reason why the US has way more reported serial killers than anywhere else. We have to make this distinction because while it seems like the US is the serial killer capital of the world, that's not the whole truth. According to data from the Radford University Serial Killer Information Center, the US is top with 3,204 recorded serial killers since serial killers started being recorded. Keep in mind that the US was one of the first countries to recognize the phenomenon of serial killers, so data from the US started to be collected a lot earlier than in other countries. England, which is super close to the US in cultural terms, was next with just 166 serial killers, but if we take population into account, this figure is not as impressive considering the US has around five times as many people. No country, large or small, can touch the US where serial killers are concerned. Although for countries with larger populations, like India and China, we have to keep in mind the previously mentioned population difference. Maybe the US is a country where serial killing for fame has become attractive to many people, because it wouldn't make sense that the US just breeds more natural-born killers than other nations. Or maybe countries with similar or larger populations are under-reporting or just not publishing their serial killer data, and countries with strict media censorship are not letting the stories get out there. The second seems a lot more likely. The Doodler The Doodler was like no one else. He was the artistic type, which you don't often find with serial killers. In 1974 and 1975, he murdered between 6 and 16 men in San Francisco, with each victim showing similar types of stab wounds. He met the men in areas known for the city's gay scene. The reason he got the name The Doodler is that one of the men he assaulted but failed to kill said he met the man while he was sketching caricatures. Police say they had a good description of The Doodler. They say he was 19 to 25 years old, he was described as black, lanky, and around 6 feet tall. Police have also released a sketch of what the man might look like now in his early to mid-60s. One of the problems with the case is some of the witnesses were not willing to testify since they wanted to keep the fact that they were homosexual under wraps. In fact, investigators said they were pretty sure their suspect was guilty, but they had their hands tied as some witnesses just wouldn't have their day in court. In 1977, the Associated Press wrote, Murder suspect free because gay is silent. Such a headline didn't seem fair to some people. The activist Harvey Milk, who became San Francisco City Supervisor only to be assassinated in 1978, said there was pressure on the men. They had families to think about, wives and children. So, this is a strange one. Police think they know who killed those men but are powerless to do anything about it. The case is still open, with detectives now trying to secure a conviction through DNA technology. As things stand, serial killing only makes up about 1% of all the murders in the US. The National Vital Statistics System said in 2021 there were 26,031 homicides in the US, so that would mean, if FBI estimates are correct, about 260 of them would be the work of active serial killers. The FBI said before that at any given time there are between 25 and 50 serial killers operating in the US. By the end of the show, you'll believe that's a fact. You might also believe the estimate is too low. Obviously, these numbers can change year to year, and it's not an exact science. 1970 to 2000 saw a bumper crop of serial killers. This is referred to as the golden age of serial killers. Hmm, and we wonder why there are so many serial killers in the USA. These days, it's much harder to go around chopping people up with axes, as there are so many CCTV and other cameras around. The axe murder of Texas and Louisiana wouldn't have gotten far in 2023, not with smart doorbells and such. It's sometimes said there are 70 million surveillance cameras in the US, although the number changes a lot depending on the source. Still, you're never far away from a camera. Serial killers are now at least more forensically aware, and they pick their moments and places better, as you'll soon see. Now let's turn our focus outside of the US. Bible John Imagine if you were a woman and you were on the dance floor of a nightclub dancing across from a good-looking fella. He then went over to you and shouted in your ear, If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. 
Hmm, what a turn on that'd be. The guy's a hottie for sure, so despite his strange sweet talk and the fact that he won't even have a drink, you decide to go home with him. On the taxi ride there, he's suddenly very quiet, then all of a sudden he leans into you and whispers, to preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart, and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. You'd be somewhat turned off, which is how we imagine the three women felt who'd met Scotland's notorious Bible John at a ballroom in Glasgow in the late 1960s, a place Bible John told a victim's sister was an adulterous den of iniquity. This guy got his strange nickname because women who met him before he killed his third victim said he'd introduced himself as John only to start quoting the Old Testament on the topic of adultery. In the taxi with the last victim, he told one of her friends, I don't drink, I pray. John beat and strangled his dates just minutes from their homes. This should have been a fairly easy case. Many people had seen him. He was obviously very religious. He was young and handsome. A sketch of him was seen by just about every person in Glasgow, while hundreds of men stood in lineups. Yet Bible John disappeared, and he remains on the loose today. Or more likely he's dead, not in ballroom heaven, but in disco hell. The Butcher of Mons The same goes for the Butcher of Mons in Belgium. He just disappeared. From January 1996 to July 1997, he dismembered five women with what police said was precision skill. The killer put various parts of their bodies into bags where after people found them, some containing feet or a head and some hands and organs. He didn't even hide the bags, he just left them close to the road. The case remains a mystery today. Cops have no idea who committed the crimes. There is ample evidence that serial killers don't just get bored and start having scruples. Killing is addictive. Once they start, they can't stop. What do you think happened to this Belgium ripper? The Vending Machine Killer It was a similar story for cops in Japan, who investigated a case in the 1980s in which 12 people were murdered and 35 more were made seriously ill when a killer put poisoned drinks in the troughs of vending machines. The victims would buy a drink and then discover there were two drinks in the trough, possibly believing they'd got two for one. Unbeknownst to the victim, the free one had been laced with dangerous herbicides. This man became known as the vending machine killer. Why he stopped, no one knows. What's worrying is there are copycats in Japan. A new kind of serial killer was born. The New York Times in 1985 quoted a Japanese psychologist who said there was a new breed of thrill-seeking criminal in Japan known as Yukai Han. The psychologist said they cynically enjoy superiority by imagining the victims groaning and do not feel any remorse. This reminded the Americans of the so-called Tylenol poisonings, in which the killer laced the drug Tylenol with potassium cyanide in various parts of Chicago. Seven people, most of them in their 20s and 30s, all bought spiked Tylenol capsules and died from September to October 1982. In those days, you could just open the bottle and put it back on the shelf. Mary Lynn Reiner bought some regular Tylenol capsules at Frank's Finer Foods, took two, and fell into a coma. Teresa Janice took one pill around dinner time. She told her husband Frank her chest hurt. She was dead just after midnight. No one was ever caught, but what's really disturbing is there were copycats. People saw the news about the murders on TV or read about it in a newspaper, and instead of naturally feeling shocked or upset, they went out and did the same thing. A year later, in 1986, a young woman in Yonkers, New York, took two tablets of extra-strength Tylenol that had been laced with cyanide. She died soon after. The New York Times said the FBI had found a second bottle of extra-strength Tylenol capsules laced with cyanide that had been seized from a store in Westchester County. Like the Chicago crimes, no one was ever convicted. Police later said there were hundreds of similar cases throughout the U.S., which led to changes in how Americans took their meds. It might have also inspired the vending machine killer. Again, it is worth noting that there was a significant increase in serial killings when global media exploded right at the time of Jack the Ripper. Sure, there were serial killings in the 17th and 18th centuries sometimes called vampires or werewolves, but when newspapers took over the world, serial killers got going. The Danilovsky Maniac Russia's Danilovsky Maniac killed at least seven people from 2004 to 2007 in the city of Cherepovitz in the Vologda Oblast. Despite a massive investigation, no one has ever been caught. Seems the killer had a change of mind, unlikely, or died or went to prison. The Stone Man did the stone man in India just stop or did he die or go to prison? In 1989, this guy went up to people sleeping in the street in Calcutta and dropped a massive stone on their heads. The cop said he was probably quite strong since the average stone weight was about 30 kilograms or 66 pounds. There were similar murders in other Indian cities, quite a lot in Mumbai, but no one was ever caught. The Monster of the Mangones there was a killer in Colombia who was active between 1963 and 1974 and had the whole country in a state of shock. 
Some people thought stories about him were so far out that he was a myth. He wasn't. This so-called monster of the Mangones should not have come as much of a surprise. After all, Colombia is infamous for its prolific serial killers. Two of the most prolific in history are Luis Garavito, aka The Beast, who viciously tortured and killed as many as 300 young men with 142 convictions in the late 1990s. He really was a beast, the sadist of the highest degree who often amputated parts of his victims before allowing them to die. Pedro Alonso Lopez, aka the Monster of the Andes, chose girls and young women as his victims, as many as 350 from 1969 to 1980 in various South American countries. But get this, he only spent 14 years in prison in Ecuador and another 4 years in a mental hospital in Colombia. He was released on a $70 bail order in 1998. Lo and behold, he disappeared and didn't see his parole officer again. Interpol and the Colombian National Police now want him in connection with some new murders. As for the monster of the Mangones, he would shove needles into his male victims' throats and draw out blood. He may have drank the blood, making his murders partly an act of vampirism. He killed up to 38 guys like this and dumped many of their bodies down an alley locally known as the Mangones. Jack the Ripper of Rwanda we don't have time to cover every country, but we think you need to know about the so-called Jack the Ripper of Rwanda. Rwanda is now an infinitely safer place than it was back in the 90s when in 94 there was genocide. But in the capital of Kigali, where prostitution is said to be rife, there's a new version of the Ripper. On August 28, 2012, this guy killed two sex workers in the poorer part of town in broad daylight. Another woman saw the act, so he killed her too. It's reported he's killed 18 women so far. But what shocked Rwandans the most is on one of the victims' flesh, he carved the words, I will stop once I have killed 400 prostitutes. The New Times of Rwanda said eyewitnesses have seen this guy many times, who's described as a slender, light-skinned man who appears to be in his early 30s. Some people accused the cops of not looking hard enough given the social standing of the victims. Police responded to these slights by saying the government of Rwanda values every person living in Rwanda regardless of what they do. Police said the reason for the murders is likely conflicts over money and revenge following an HIV AIDS contamination. 45.8% of sex workers are HIV positive and apparently at the root of the problem. But his criminal profile might also meet the criteria for the missionary killer, a special kind of serial killer who tells himself he's on a mission to exterminate something he feels is evil, dangerous, or just bad. The next story is so horrible it would shock Ted Bundy. The Forest of Horror in 2014, Nigerian media reported about the Ibadan House of Horror in the city of Ibadan, Oyo State in Nigeria, the country's third largest city. The house had been used for human sacrifices. All around it were buried bodies and body parts in various states of decomposition, including skeletons. Inside the house were 21, maybe 23 victims, many shackled and driven half mad by despair. The entire area stank of rotting corpses. One Nigerian writer summed it up saying, no adjective or description is too much to express the horror. A Nigerian newspaper said, the police rescued no fewer than 20 corpses and 21 living persons described as lunatics in various horrible health conditions from the scene. The discovery of so many human skulls and the continued exhuming of many more point to the idea that the spot might have existed for a long time. The discovery caused small riots. Families soon asked if their loved ones who'd gone missing had ended up at this horrible house of torture and death. Worse, the Nigerian media and some of the public pointed to wealthy people and even officials and politicians who were accused of hiring kidnappers to find young folks for their sacrifices, which were believed to bring them good fortune. Police still haven't found the culprits, but it's widely believed people of high standing are behind this obscene set of crimes that have gone on for years and possibly claimed hundreds of victims. Some of the victims said, indeed, when they were kidnapped, the people taking them had said they were officials. This case remains a mystery, but according to the press and the public, something stinks to high heaven here. Someone knows more than they're letting on. Now for some killers you might bump into one night on your way home from work. The West Mesa Bone Collector In 2009, out in the desert of West Mesa in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a woman's dog dug up a bone. It was a human bone. Police got on the case and soon the remains of 11 women aged between 15 and 32 were found after a crime scene said to be as large as 75 football fields was cordoned off for the dig. It was believed most of the victims were sex workers. One of the victims was four months pregnant at the time of her death. A news reporter wrote, all young women heinously murdered and then deep-sixed into the grit in a forlorn desert. 
Their families claimed the local police made no effort to find them after they were reported missing. Was this the work of human traffickers, a deranged serial killer, or perhaps drug lords? It was said these women knew each other. They worked the streets and scored drugs in what's sometimes referred to as Albuquerque's war zone. How had they ended up in the ground not far from each other? There have been plenty of suspects, and yet again the case remains open. This next one will chill you to the bone. The Colonial Parkway Killer You've heard of the Zodiac Killer, but we doubt many of you have heard of the Colonial Parkway Killer. You'll likely recall the movie Zodiac, which shows the Zodiac Killer shooting a couple in a car parked down a lover's lane. This happened in real life. That's what the Colonial Parkway Killer did too, down a dark, mostly deserted road called the Colonial Parkway in Virginia. But he did it to three couples, killing them all, while another couple went missing. The murders happened between 1986 and 1989. They might have all been the work of one man, but since the deaths involved strangulation, gunshot, as well as stabbings, they might have also been the work of multiple killers taking advantage of the very dark stretch of road. Then again, in each case the victims weren't robbed, and each time the killer drove their car away. In the first case in October 1986, the victims were both United States Naval Academy class of 1981 graduates. Kathy and Becky were a gay couple who at some point during the night must have been approached by a man perhaps armed with a gun. Both victims were found with rope burns on their wrists and necks. They'd both been slashed so violently that they were almost decapitated. The killer then doused their bodies in gasoline, although he didn't light it. There might be other victims of the same killer not part of his official eight count, such as 25-year-old Brian Craig Pettinger, who'd been hogtied and thrown into a river while still alive, or 18-year-old Lori Ann Powell Compton, who'd slammed a car door shut on her boyfriend after an argument and walked off into the night, only to be found later with stab wounds in her back. Maybe the killer struck again in 1996. That year, the bodies of 24-year-old Julianne Marie Williams and 26-year-old Laurel Salisbury Winans were discovered. The two had been camping in Virginia's Shenandoah National Park. Like some of the other victims, they were bound and stabbed. Like those other people, the killer wasn't directly sexually motivated. Now for perhaps the strangest case of them all, and arguably the one you should be the most concerned about. All you good-looking sporty types out there, listen carefully. The Smiley Face Killer the story of the smiley face killer is like a campfire horror tale you tell to your friends. It's a movie, a myth, and yet, it might just be real. It's the story of at least three dozen young white men who in the 1990s and 2000s, up until the present day, were all found drowned in a body of water. The cases were mysterious, given that the men could swim and no one saw them fall into the water. Some people blamed booze and the hijinks young guys are apt to get up to, but others found the cases very, very strange. Three dozen mysterious drownings of a similar kind of young men is a lot, and there might be dozens more. One of the reasons this has been blamed on a serial killer or a group of connected serial killers is the fact that next to or near where the men drowned, there was always a smiley face piece of graffiti drawn on the wall. Something like 45 males have been found dead in the water in 11 states, often seen last at a party or a bar. The smiley face was always nearby. Detectives who worked on the case noted that these men fit a certain kind of profile. They were successful, popular, sporty types, the kind of guy some people might resent. 19 of these dead men were found in just two states, Minnesota and Wisconsin, but the detectives believe the killers have struck all over the US. One of those detectives said he's sure there is a well-structured, organized gang with cells in major cities across the US who drug, abduct, hold the victims for a period of time before they murder them and then place them in the water. This isn't a joke, they are deadly serious. Some critics of the detective's theory believe the smiley face is so common, it's just a coincidence the men died close to where they were painted. Others have argued that it wasn't always possible to know exactly where the men died. The FBI has said it has no evidence there is a serial killer, stating these instances appear to be alcohol-related drownings. Tell that to the family and friends of a young man named Dakota James, who on December 15, 2016 called his friend Shelly on the phone sometime in the evening. Dakota was in total panic, crying. He told her, I don't know where I am, I'm so cold, please help me, I'm lost. He sounded unbelievably desperate. She found him by using a cell phone location app, he was somewhere on Pittsburgh's south side, still in shock. He hardly spoke at first but told her the police had refused to help him. He'd actually asked them for help and they just shrugged him off. Dakota explained to Shelley he'd been at a work Christmas party hosted by the transport company he worked at, and the last time he remembered anything was about 7.15 p.m. Four hours later, he was walking around Pittsburgh not knowing where he'd been or what he was doing. Shelley thought it might have been a matter of too much booze or maybe at worst he'd been drugged, but Dakota seemed okay the next day. Five weeks later, he went missing, and this time Shelley would not get a call. 
On March 6, 2017, some 40 days later, a woman walking her dog found Dakota bloated and dead in the Ohio River. During the autopsy, the powerful general anesthetic GHB, known as the data salt drug, was found in his system. Did Dakota run into the same people as he did five weeks earlier? Had he been stalked? Had he actually been lucky to survive the first attack at his work party? He was young, good-looking, and athletic, the profile that fit the victims of the smiley face killer. His PayPal account had been used just two days after he'd vanished. His body certainly had not been in the water for 40 days, according to pathologists, so where had he been for 40 days? Why hadn't he called home? He wouldn't do that kind of thing. His death had been ruled an accident. But a pathologist named Cyril Wecht, who later reviewed his case, said Dakota had ligature marks on his neck. And guess what? On the closest bridge to where he was found, the Roberto Clemente Bridge, there were 11 smiley face symbols spray painted onto the concrete. This bridge was a few miles away, but it was still the closest bridge to where Dakota was found, and where police say he fell in. By now you guys watching this video understand very well how serial killers copy each other. They watch something on the news and they replicate it. For power, for infamy, to satiate a sick urge. That's what some detectives think has happened here. That in the USA there were and maybe still are ruthless and brutal people killing for fun and drawing a smiley face near to where they dumped the bodies. Now retired, these detectives say the smiley face killers have murdered around 100 people and they've linked 250 cases to them in total. One of the detectives is so sure of this that he He's remortgaged his house and maxed his credit cards trying to solve the case. Both detectives say this depraved gang is highly organized, using various medications on people, stalking them, and choosing a specific target, with each murder being meticulously planned on the dark web. One of the detectives said in an interview in 2019, the level of sophistication of the group is a lot greater than we'd imagined. Now we know they communicate with each other on the dark web. We know there's surveillance and counter surveillance. Maybe the FBI is right and there are about 250 murders a year that are the work of American serial killers, or maybe something much darker lurks behind the headlines that we see in our day-to-day -day media. Now you really have to watch how these sneaky serial killers finally got caught, or get to know what the profilers and detectives do, and how serial killer profilers actually catch serial killers.